so I can throw this out there again. If you're just joining us, I think everybody is is returning. Uh, I'm live the, again. Uh, Meta7.com, there is a discount um, if, that I've got set up that's good until tomorrow night. Uh, just for those of us in this group, uh, nobody else knows about it, so don't share it outside of uh, our group. I'm going to put that but, link up uh, again. If you log on, uh, no, the, the discount is not available on Amazon. Uh, is Meta730 available on Amazon? My answer is I don't know. Um, that part of what we do is actually handled by a different group. We don't handle that because they are, they, they deal with everything from the boxing, the shipping, the, 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 um, getting it where it's available for Amazon prime for that, um, overnight delivery kind of thing that they have and all that, that takes a lot of work. Uh, and as a, as a busy physician, I have to limit, uh, my time in certain areas. And so we don't do that. Um, but if you go on to, um, I, hang on, I gotta check on the dog. <laughs> check on the dog. I've just, st I'm back up live again now on my channel. Um, and I've got three. Let me know that you're back, whoever you are. So I've put that link up again. Alright, you go on out. Put that right. link up again. So Charlie came over with the DW and said hi to us and she just went back out. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, thank you all, and I hope you. Uh, I hope the discount helps some people, um, you know, buy when they when they weren't going to or couldn't before because of the price. And I I, I just want to help you guys out. That's and, really cool. Um, that's good. Uh, all right, um, let's see. Back to let's part see. one. Okay, let's let's. Um, Four. Are you okay if I just start talking about some of these questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, on you go. On you go. Okay. Hi, Debs. Uh, somebody talked about: Is there a natural way to work on your COPD? COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It is a combination problem generally of asthma, a form of asthma or reactive airway disease, and emphysema. Uh, and as a result, uh, you end up with lungs that don't work right. And a lot of times what happens is there's air trapping and there's inflammation in the lungs. Now, once you have damage to the lungs, once the air sacs, the smallest little sacs in the lungs, once they break down, cigarette smoke causes this, pollution causes it, inflammation causes it. Once they break down, the little, the little sacs become bigger and bigger sacs. And those sacs, S-A-C-S, they don't they don't uh, transfer oxygen and, and uh, carbon dioxide back and forth very well anymore. And as a result, you don't have the ability to do the things that you want to do because you can't oxygenate your blood as well. Now, another thing that happens is, is the lungs will actually begin to collapse. Little areas of the lungs will actually shut down and trap air. So the problem with COPD isn't that you can't inhale. With asthma, often people can't inhale. With COPD, the problem is you can't exhale. You can't get the air out of your lungs, and you end up breathing at the, at the, at the top of your chest like this a lot, right? You get barrel-chested. So people that have smoked for a long time, you'll see they have a big barrel chest because they've got emphysema, and they're, they're making their rib cage larger and larger and larger. No, I'm not talking about capillaries, Violet. I'm talking about the sacs, the air sacs. Now... The things that we can do naturally to help with COPD are the things that reduce inflammation in the body. So some of the things that we've talked about, if you are still eating animal products, the number one thing you can do to reduce your inflammation in your body is to remove the animal products. That's number one. Not talking about bronchiectasis. Bronchiectatic patients are entirely different. That's a different thing, Deborah. It, it's a good idea, but it's different. All right. Number two, if you can't give up your animal products, you need to increase your ratio of omega of omega three to omega six. Omega six is highly inflammatory and is what you get from your animal products. And the reason that people started taking fish oil was because it increased their omega threes, which are are anti inflammatory. So it's about this ratio of sixes and threes that we're working on here. Now there are some other oils. There's some other essential. Uh, fatty acids and so forth. But the number one thing you can do besides going to a whole food plant-based diet is to increase your omega-3s. The next thing I, and I would say fish oil is your, is, is not your best choice. 
anymore because we know now you can get the same effect from flaxseed oil and flaxseed oil I think is, is in general safer than fish oil, okay? Um, the next thing I would do is I would add turmeric and some of the other roots that Sue talked about that are naturally anti-inflammatory, okay? And then finally, I can't stress enough, if your doctor has you on a medication, we have uh, the Lama Labas and the Ics, okay? We have the inhaled corticosteroids, we have the long-acting uh, beta agonists, and we have the, the muscarinic uh, uh, antagonists. So the Lama Labas, uh, use your medicine, your medicine that, you, that you're supposed to take once a day, not your rescue inhalers. Make sure that you use those medicines on a daily basis because they will help prevent your lungs from not functioning correctly. So um, there you go. So natural products would be anything that's going to kick your omega-3s up and then the natural anti-inflammatories uh, like turmeric. So that's what I would recommend for COPD. That's um, brilliant. Wink has that, okay. uh, Wink has that mildly. Okay. So, uh, right, I have a plant-based omega-3 and I shall start putting turmeric in everything that he eats. There you go. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, you can always give him a little flaxseed oil in there too, or a little, just a little flax seeds. Yeah, right? I can do. Yeah. I can add flax seeds to it. Right, okay. I will, I, I'm so, going to get him to watch this uh, first six minutes so that he can hear what you have to say on it because, you know, it's the problem with thing. COPD versus a lot of the other things we're, to, gonna, we're talking about is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic obstructive lung disease it's called sometimes, but this situation where you have a reactivity and you have emphysema or broken down air sacs in the lungs is generally speaking, the emphysema part of it is not reversible. That damage is permanent. We don't grow new, new lung tissue like that, okay? So once you have it, you have it. Uh, I got it because I grew up with smokers. I grew up with two heavy smokers in my household. So as a result of that, I have COPD now because my lungs were damaged when I was a, when I was a child. So I'm dealing with that, plus I live in a city, plus I get exposed to pollution and all those things. Uh, never having been a smoker, I do enjoy the occasional cigar, but I never inhale it, okay? So for me... Um, when I quit animal products, I no longer had to use inhalers. I was having to use two inhalers, okay? So the results of me being able to speak like this now with inhalers, this result is not because I've added something like the turmeric or the flax or those kind of things to my diet. It's because I took out the animal products and the dairy and, the, and, and all of that, okay? It, it dramatically reduced the inflammation in my body to the point where I no longer had the reactive portion of things. Pulmonary fibrosis is not the same thing as COPD. These are all different things. So somebody talked about bronchiectasis. Uh, uh, pulmonary fibrosis is different. But with lung diseases, you have a lot of mix of these different things. So anything that you can do to reduce inflammation in your lungs is going to improve your lung condition irrespective of whether you have pulmonary fibrosis, whether you have... Um, reversible lung disease like asthma, whether you have COPD, or emphysema, chronic lung problems like that. Okay, so I hope I hope we've covered that fairly well. Uh, um, I want to move on to the B12 questions. Uh, I've just Unless got a quick add, question. I can, I... can I just ask you a question? Yeah. Alina said, "What about people who have chronic bronchitis?" Chronic bronchitis is COPD. Right. These are the same things. Okay. Cool. Okay. Well, okay. So cool, some some excellent. some forms of COPD um, are people they produce lots and lots of lots of mucus. We think of them more as the chronic bronchitis. And then some people don't produce as much mucus, but they don't have very much in the way of air sacs. So as a result, they just don't oxygenate very well. So either way, you have an inflammatory problem. The body reacts in different ways to different stimulants. So the chronic bronchitis, that uh, the chronic mucus production, we fight that with uh, mucinex or guafenicin right over the counter. And then we do all the same things we talked about. Try to stop smoking. Stay away from pollution. Use oxygen at bedtime if necessary. Uh, and get these natural anti-inflammatories we're talking about, okay? Um, B12, different kinds of B12. Um, somebody, I, I can't remember specific what the, what the question was. Uh, methylcobalamin is the best, the best oral form of B12. 
if you're going to not use methylcobalamin, which if you if you take methylcobalamin orally, you will absorb it. Okay, it is the absorbable form. If you use cyanocobalamin and you put it under your tongue, you can also absorb it. But if you swallow cyanocobalamin, most of that's going to be destroyed in your stomach. All right. But if you put it under your tongue, it can be absorbed. But before it can be used by the body, your body has to cleave the cyanide molecule off the B12. That sounds really crazy, but it's absolutely true that you're putting something in your body to help you feel better that's got cyanide in it. Now, if that makes sense to you, let me know because it doesn't make sense to me. Um, so here's Karen. You're on three, three and a half liters of oxygen, uh, hopefully by nasal cannula 24-7. Uh, you know, you, you have severe uh, pulmonary problems. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, COPD, um, awful, awful. Um, and the biggest problem with COPD is really the only cure for it is a lung transplant, uh, unfortunately. Um, okay, so the B12, if you give yourself an injection, it's the same thing. The B12 gets into your body, it gets into the bloodstream, but your body still has to process it to make it work. It does work, um, but just your body has to has to metabolize and cleave the b12 and cleave the cyanide molecule off so these are different forms of b12 if you go buy a multivitamin or if you get yourself a b complex that you're supposed to swallow if it has cyanocobalamin in it you're not going to get the b12 boost that you're looking for and that's why a lot of people that take a multivitamin say ah, i don't really notice anything okay that's why people come to me and they want b12 shots because they've learned if they get a b12 shot they really feel better because they're getting that the b12 that's no longer in the food b12 is not in the food like it used to be because of the pesticides and herbicides that we put on our crops um, corporate farming has caused us basically to sterilize the soil in which we're growing our fruits and ve we're growing our vegetables for the most part. And what's happening there then is the bacteria die. The bacteria are what produces the B12 that we need to get out of our, our, our fruits and vegetables. And we're just not getting it anymore. So we need to supplement B12, especially if you're a whole food plant-based person who's not all organic. If you're, if you're getting or, more organic foods, then you have less of a need for the B12. But in general, you're going to pay way too much for that stuff. It's just easier to supplement the B12. So I hope I've answered that question. Can I just the next ask question you, was, can I ask you one more? Is um, pulmonary, uh, oh, hang on a second, it's just gone off the page. Is restrictive lung disease COPD? Restrictive lung disease is often uh, secondary to a, a fibrosis problem. Sometimes restrictive lung disease can be what I like to call a uh, Pickwickian problem, which you may know more about than I do, but it's due to the body habitus. It is due to the way our bodies are constructed. Some of us don't do a good job of moving our chest when we breathe. Some of us don't do a good job of depressing the diaphragm so we can fill our lungs with air okay so in some of these persons they actually have a restrictive lung disease caused by a mechanical problem of their by their body and a good chest surgeon can fix that okay bye Deborah sorry you have to go um, all right let's go back to um, type 1.5 what's my definition of type 1.5 diabetes and 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 people probably haven't heard about this or maybe they heard it before and they want me to go over it again what i have learned is there's a great convergence over time between type 1 and type 2 diabetics so what is a type 1 diabetic a type 1 diabetic is a person who either is born with a genetic defect and is no and is not able to produce insulin at all or they develop an autoimmune disease and it that autoimmune disease attacks the beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin so they lose the ability to produce uh, insulin as well so a type 1 diabetic is an insulin dependent diabetic they cannot live without insulin they do not initially benefit whatsoever 
from oral agents that increase sensitivity, that cause uh, the pancreas to try to work harder, all those things, they don't work for type 1 diabetes because the type 1 diabetes is a very specific, less than 10%. In fact, I think it's less than 5% of diabetics are type 1, okay? So in general, when we talk about diabetes and, and curing and, and improving and all of that, we're talking about type 2 diabetes, which is the great epidemic of diabetes uh, of, of this millennium that, that we're starting with, okay? Type 2 diabetes is a person who has, because of their nutrition, because of their weight, because of a number of factors, they have become resistant to their own naturally circulating insulin. Their body is making insulin, but the body can't keep up with the need for more insulin because of the fact that the insulin is not effective when it reaches the muscle cells and the other cells in our body where we're trying to take up the glucose that's coming in through our diet. So as a result, glucose levels start going high, and at the same time, we're not able to get that glucose into the cells, so we're getting sick. And so in response, our body is making more and more and more insulin. So our insulin levels are going up, and our glucose levels are going up simultaneously. They're both going up which is what makes this all crazy when you see these advertisements for type 2 diabetic patients that their idea is start start your patients on insulin. That's like pouring fire, a, few, a gasoline on a fire. You're only going to make the problem worse because you have a form of toxicity that comes from the insulin. Ins too much insulin makes you sick too. All right, so over time, a type 1 diabetic, they're getting insulin shots or got, they have a pump. They're eating animal products too. So they are going to start becoming insulin resistant and they're going to start needing more insulin to keep up with the demand. And guess what? They also will start to be, they'll begin to benefit from some of the oral medications that improve sensitivity. Okay? So here you have a situation where that type 1 diabetic is getting symptoms or developing the same, some of the same problems of a type 2 diabetic. So they're moving over away from type 1 to a somewhere between type 1 and type 2. That's a type 1.5. Now, let's take our type 2 diabetic. They're over here. They are on already three or four oral medications. And guess what? We're not able to keep up with the, the, the amount of insulin that they need despite all of these medicines. They still need insulin. So they are becoming insulin dependent. So your type 1 diabetics and your type 2 diabetics are merging. There's this great collision. They're all turning into type 1.5s, all right? So if you're a type 2 diabetic and you're becoming more and more insulin resistant, it's becoming more and more likely after 10 years, 15 years, that somebody's going to say to you, we have to put you on insulin now. You've become a type 1.5. You actually have a level of insulin uh, demand uh, that you have developed. You have to get insulin because your body can't make enough anymore. You've burned out your pancreas. You can't make enough insulin even with all the insulin sensitizers to control your glucose so you can reverse that still by eliminating animal products you can reverse the process some can become healed of the, of the type 2 diabetes some cannot the type 1 diabetics if they will go back to uh, a whole food plant-based diet then they can come off the orals but they're still going to need their insulin uh, the only cure for type 1 diabetes is a pancreas transplant. Hang on a second for me, guys. Okay, Danny's gone. Right, I'm gonna, can you still hear me? I'm having dog problems. Over here. Dog problems. Come here, Charlie, come say hi. Come say hi. Come here. Come say hi. Come say hi. So she came in with the DW a little while ago, and then she wanted to hang out. She didn't want to go back in the house, and then she wanted to stay with me. Well, as soon as the DW left... She ran back out, but then she didn't get back in the house. Yes, yeah, a good girl. And so then she came back in. She's been scratching at the door. She wanted to get back oh, in with me. So here yes. we go. Okay, back on the floor. All right. So um, she's in. So sorry about that. That's so that, okay. that's what I talk about. When I talk about type 1.5, most of the time I'm talking about type 2 diabetics that are needing insulin. They are developing a lot of the characteristics of type 1 diabetes, and that's why People who are selling, manufacturing insulin are now marketing now to physicians. They're coming to us and say, you need to start putting your patients on insulin sooner. And I look at them and I say, I would just as soon 
pour gasoline on an out of control fire as add insulin to a type 2 diabetic. And they look at me like, well, how do you keep them under control? I try to teach them to eat right and take their medicines, lose weight and exercise, and we can beat this. We don't have to make it worse. And you guys are not even addressing the problem of hyperinsulinemia. And I get in their case, I get in their face about it and I ask them, what are you guys doing about hyperinsulinemia? You're making it worse. You're not a solution. You're, you're worsening the problem. Well, I bet they don't like that very much. Man, I'm really going at it tonight. Excellent. This is what we love. I've got Nancy's asking, is hypothyroidism insulin resistant? No, hasn't, they're not related. Not they're, related. They're, they're completely separate things. And Hang on for me. I have to answer a text message. This is important. TV show important. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah, you've got some news to share there. That's that's for sure. Hi, Julie. Hi, Debs. Um, Victoza. What about Victoza? That's the next question I've got for you all. Uh, Victoza is a medication. It's uh, based on a protein that was identified in the saliva of the Gila monster. It was. It was. It is a fabulous drug. It works, I believe, in eight different areas of the body to improve insulin sensitivity. Wow. It is one of the best drugs that we have for type 2 diabetes. The Victoza, the Trulicity, the, um, there's a new one that I, uh, Ozempic. I always think of Olympic. Ozempic. But here's the kicker that you guys are going to love as far as type 2 diabetes and the GLP-1 inhibitors or GLP-1 agonists, I can't remember. Uh, next year, we should see our first oral version of this medication. Right now, they're all injectables, so they're non-insulin injectables. So very soon, we should see a GLP-1 uh, that is oral, and it's going to change the way we treat type 2 diabetes uh, as far as medically, for physicians, this is an exciting development because it's a wonderful drug, but it's difficult to get people to take a shot every day, uh, especially if it's a non-insulin injection. Uh, so, that is uh, there we go. Uh, so, so diabetes is a, is a great topic. We, we can talk for a long time about diabetes, um, but when we look at uh, the Western diet and we look at the epidemic of diabetes and obesity, these are related. In fact, some people call it diabetes, right, because they're tied together. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result of consuming more and more animal products, we're building insulin resistance at the cellular level. And as a result of that, we're, we have to produce more insulin to get glucose taken care of in, in the bloodstream. Uh, and it, it leads to all kinds of problems. The elevated insulin levels lead to problems. The elevated glucose leads to problems. It causes damage to the retina, to your vision. You lose your vision over time. It's the number one reason why people have to go on dialysis is type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is entirely preventable and curable. We do not have to be this sick, people. We don't have to be sick. We don't have to tolerate this. You don't have to be obese. You don't have to be type 2 diabetic. You can reverse this. Okay, I want to talk about an area that is near and dear to me, and it's about grief. And it's about people who uh, either eat out of grief or experience unresolved medical problems because of grief. Grief is a powerful emotional state that must be dealt with. Listen to me very closely. If you have grief, if you have not dealt with your grief, you will never be well. You will remain sick. You will be utterly and totally convinced that you're sick because of a medical problem that your doctors cannot find and cannot cure. And it, it, it is a medical problem. It is, and it is curable. But you must deal with your grief. You must go through the painful process of grieving. If you lost a loved one and you have not grieved their loss, 
you will be sick. You will not be well. And that's just a fact. When I lost my first wife in a car accident in 1999, I was sick for two and a half years until finally somebody pulled me aside and said, John, why don't you come to my office? We need to talk. Okay? And that person was a psychiatrist. He was in my residency program. I had gone back to do a family practice or family medicine residency. This individual was an expert. God bless me. This individual was an expert in grief and unresolved grief. Uh, he was a previous dean at a medical school in West Virginia, a uh, brilliant man, uh, an author uh, of many papers about grief. It was his specialty area. And he sat me down and we talked, and, and he began to explain to me that I needed to grieve because I had all the symptoms and signs of unresolved grief. And he was right. I had never properly grieved the loss of my wife. I had not grieved. I was the man. I had to be strong. I had to, I had to move on with life. I had to do all of those things that still needed to be done. Um, and I hadn't done them. And as a result, I was emotionally a mess. Okay? I was not normal. I wasn't healthy. Um, I was, I, I had a lot of problems. Okay? I was sick. And he worked with me and he gave me exercises things to do to begin the grieving process. And it took me a while, but once I started grieving, it was one of the most painful things I have ever been through in my life. And we're talking about two years after I lost my wife. I went through the grieving process. It took me about four months. I was miserable, but I grieved. I was able afterward I was able to be healed. I, I actually was healed of the grief. Okay, I was healed of the loss. We never get over the loss of a loved one or the loss of something the way we think we do. We grieve. Some people get an illness and they come in and they find out that they're never going to be the same again. They get a, they get a diagnosis of an illness and they go into grief. They go into a, a grieving stage. And if they don't grieve the loss of that normal state of health, it'll make them even sicker. Sometimes I have to refer patients to grief counselors to get them to learn how to grieve because we don't have enough time to sit in the office and do the counseling. Uh, they need a counselor. They need a 45-minute appointment with a counselor to sit and talk and work through these issues and understand all of the steps and stages and things that you have to do to grieve. If you don't do them, you're not going to be well. And no, you don't have to do them in the order that these books all say. My grief, the, the, the grief that I went through, the stages were all mixed up, that everything was different. Everybody grieves in their own way. And nothing infuriated me more than somebody who had never lost a person, had lost a loved one the way that I did. I knew how I felt. I wanted to, I absolutely wanted to lose my mind with these people. They had no idea what I was going through. They had no idea the pain that I dealt with. And because of what I went through, I'm able to recognize unresolved grief in patients. I've helped, I've helped a lot of people with their grief. I've helped a lot of people realize that they had unresolved grief and they were sick, not because they had some suspicious disease that nobody could find. They, were, they had never grieved. And I get these people and I can help them. If I can get them to listen, if I can get them into grief training or grief, grief counseling, they will come out a changed person. They'll come out a healed person. Again, you don't ever get over grief. You come out of grief a different person. You change through the grief. It is necessary. If you don't do it, you'll be sick. Stories I have, a uh, patient we had in, in our residency program uh, whose mother died of liver cancer, I believe it was, and in the last stages of her life, this young girl saw her mother die. And the last few months of her life were almost spent with uncontrollable vomiting. Well, this young lady who was in our clinic, she was an adult, had unexplained vomiting. 
She'd been to gastroenterologists. She'd been to surgeons. She'd been to specialists all over the place. Nobody could discover why she was vomiting, why she was sick all the time. She was always sick. She was super thin. So this doctor that worked with me got her into his office and began to work with her, and it took, it took a while, but he finally got her to grieve. He taught her how important it was to grieve and taught her what to expect and what she needed to do to begin the grieving process. And when she did, she began to improve. Her symptoms began to improve. And when she was finished with it, she only rarely would have even a little bit of nausea. But it was a long process. It was a year. It was over a year's worth of work with her because this was such an, uh, a, a difficult thing for her to go through. She had refused to grieve because this was part of her childhood when she was eight or nine years old when she had seen this. And she had never forgiven herself for allowing her mother to die, and she felt responsible, and she didn't. She never. She would never accept the death, and, and she, she refused all of the grief. She refused it all, and it made her sick. So, unresolved grief is something that I know something about, not just from a physician standpoint, but as a patient standpoint. I've been there. And I do know what it's like to lose somebody you love. And I know what it's like to not deal with those feelings and for it to make you feel sick and for you not to be well and for nothing to be right. And I see people that come to my clinic that have just lost a loved one. And I counsel them and I say, listen, you've got a long road you need to hoe here. This is not going to be something you're going to be able to get over right away. And this is not about your inner strength or inner person or anything like that. You have a real loss here and you're going to have to deal with this. And don't make any decisions, any large decisions. I knew a person whose mother died. And so he divorced his wife. Because subconsciously, he believed that if he divorced his wife, he would get his mother back. Because he married and then his mother died. And there you go. There's this connection. So he divorces this lady remarries later, and their relationship isn't working either. There you go. Unresolved grief. We get him into grief counseling. He's able to restore the relationship of the wife he's currently married with, but he regrets that he lost the first one because it didn't have to happen. It was a major decision that he made in grief. He divorced this lady because he was grieving, and he was looking for a way out of it. He was looking to be healthy. But he couldn't find his health again. He couldn't find rightness again. And so his solution was to get a divorce. It had nothing to do with this lady. This poor lady was a victim of his grief. So how powerful is grief? Grief uh -huh. is extremely powerful. Grief must be dealt with. That's, I think that's the first thing I said about grief. You must deal with your grief. You must do the grief work. If you don't do the work... And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, grief work is extremely fatiguing. Nothing will make you feel more exhausted than to properly grieve. Because at the end of the day, when you have to do that grief work, you won't have any energy. It saps you of your emotional energy. I could not even talk about my first wife in those first two years without breaking down in tears. I couldn't even talk about it. I, I refused to deal with it. I would, I would just cry. But when I got in with, with, uh, with, with the psychiatrist who was, who was one of our teachers, okay, and once he got me to uh, agree to listen to him, which I did, he helped me grieve. He helped me in a way that no medicine could have ever helped me. He helped me heal. He's, he was a true healer right? and, 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 a, and a great man, and he taught me so very much about grief um, and, and a lot about psychiatry in general. Uh, and I do a lot of psychiatry in my office. I think a lot of family medicine doctors do practice a lot of psychiatry. It's part of what we do. It's, we take care of whatever comes in, and people come in with psychiatric problems, and we deal with them. So I hope I answered. Um, I don't remember now. I'm sorry. Who asked the question about grief? Um, but if you have eating problems and it is due to unresolved grief, 
you are not going to fix your eating problems until you deal with that grief. And you need to find a grief counselor. And if you need a source, a, the best place I found to call to find grief counselors is, it to, is to call your local hospice organizations. These hospice groups have grief counseling sessions and they have experienced grief counselors and oftentimes they will meet with you for free. They will counsel with you for free, oftentimes. Sometimes if, if they can get an insurance payment, that's great, but many times these people are so devoted to what they do that they will work with you even if you don't have any money. Okay, because they understand how important it is for the healing process. And if you don't have the ability to go one on one, you can find grief groups, and there are lots of wonderful books. Uh, when they came, I'll never forget that day when they came and they dragged the, the, the lady came and took me out. I was working in an emergency room and said, There's some men here that need to talk to you. And I walked into a room, and there were two DPS officers standing there. And I smiled and I said, Well, this can't be good. And they handed me uh, what looked like it come off of, you know, a, an automatic printer of some kind. And I read it, and, I, I, and my, my life was forever changed, you know. And so, but I can talk about it today, and I can talk about it, and I can maintain who I am as a human being because I did that grief work. And if I hadn't done that grief work, I wouldn't have been able to sit here and talk to you guys about how important it is to grieve. Yeah. Okay? Absolutely. I wouldn't have gotten well. I got well. Does that mean I don't miss her? No. Does that mean I won't ever, that I stop loving her? No. The DW understands, I, that comes with me. That's who I am as a person. Uh, I love this lady that I lost. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so blessed to have Jill. I'm so blessed to have her as part of my life. She rescued us from here. There I was. We were a wreck. I had these two little boys, and we were a wreck, you know. And uh, she, uh, she, she stepped up. She stepped up to the plate, and she said, "I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with these boys, and I'm going to help you with your, you know, with your life." And she became such an important part of of us, and um, so blessed. And, and I don't deserve her. Never have. Never will. She's wonderful. So, uh, if you have a grief problem that's causing you to live a certain way or behave a certain way or feel sick and you haven't dealt with that grief, pro grief problem, I promise you, you will not get well until you do. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Let's go on to something else. That's fantastic. That, well, thank you very much for sharing that. That's really valuable. And I think, Lynn, your, the answer to your question is probably yes. Could a miscarriage 10 years ago still be causing a person to be ill? If, you, if you've not grieved the loss of that child, you have unresolved grief. Yeah. There you go. So, fantastic. Absolutely amazing. Uh, and that's, I didn't know that. Uh, Linda says, uh, after her spouse died, she received grief counseling for a year. Hospice was already involved with us. Thank God for hospice. Let me tell you what, Linda, hospice is wonderful. What they do for families after someone passes is amazing. Uh, they don't. They stop getting paid after the patient passes, but they don't stop working. Hospice, hospice people are beautiful, wonderful people. Um, here's another thing that, that people don't think about causes a, a form of unresolved grief, and that's divorce. Uh, divorce, when you lose uh, a spouse through divorce, you need to grieve. There is a grief, and, and it, you, you could have been abused. You could have, you, that person could have absolutely mistreated you in as many ways possible, but you lost something with that divorce. You need to grieve. It's very, very important. Wow. Um, I'm going to scroll back. Laurie, it was you, Laurie. I hope I answered your question. I hope I, hope I did. Um, there's lots of wonderful comments that I've missed. I'm just going to have to go through them later. I don't yeah, want to take up time. Okay. I, I think everybody's um, just gone at this end. Um, I'm sorry. You, know. you guys no, asked. No, 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 no. I'm just, you know, that there, there's not lo uh, lots of com They've just been transfixed like I was. I think probably people thought I was frozen. 
because I didn't move for so long. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. Like, it, like, you know, we don't get to pick these lives. We don't get to pick these bodies. We don't get to pick. We don't get to pick a lot about what happens in our lives. And and uh, you know, um, we're spiritual beings. We're we're emotional beings. Um, you know, we we can't ignore that that part of who we are uh, as humans, human beings. We can't we can't ignore that. If we do, it's to our own detriment. You know, it really is. Well, I think Lynn, Lynn is saying it's her daughter who she who lost a, a child. Lynn, sit her down with this video and let her have a listen to what Dr. G's just said because that's absolutely that's a piece of gold dust there that information i never heard that before never heard um, that before. next year will be 20 years next yeah. year will be 20 years she died in 1999 uh, so she never got to see the millennium and i didn't get to say goodbye to her um and i think when, when i realized that um that most people when they lose Someone they love in a tragic way. They, that's they feel that way. They, they feel they feel that they didn't get to say goodbye and to let that person know how special they were, uh, or or are. And and, and I, it it's made me um, a better human being. Uh, it, it, her death was a gift in in a way in that it helped me understand how precious life is. Mm. Um. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow. I mean, we're just not. She was killed tragically in a car accident, and that's that. Um, you know, and and you know, next year um, it, it'll be important for me to go to the to to her to the the, the cemetery. It'll be important for me to talk to her, um, and and I need to do all that. I'll do all that next year. Uh, it'll be twenty years next year, and that's a milestone. Um, and we and I haven't talked to her in a while, and so I need to go do that. So. That's, you know, it's just, uh, it needs to happen. And it will. It'll happen next year. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, so, you know, things happen. And um, she'll always be a part of me. I love her. You know, um, and uh, she always will be a part of me. And anybody that's lost somebody, and you can truly say to me that you know how I feel, then you know how I feel. You know? <laughs> Uh, and and that's true. It doesn't mean I it doesn't mean I love Jill any less than I, I possibly could. I love her with all my heart. I love every bit of her, and um, I know how precious that is. And uh, you know, so yeah. <laughs> don't take anybody for granted. Uh, yeah, let's love one another. Yeah, that's my son. Always tells me he loves me constantly. He always like if he rings me from school, he'll go, okay then. Love you, Mum. So there, there will always be, you know, I'm not anticipating anything, uh, but uh, it's important to tell the people you love that you love them so that you know they know that you know that they, that you love them. Um, in fact, Julia said her problem is anticipating her father's passing. He's been sick a lot recently and he's 90. Some people begin grieving sooner. Some people will begin grieving the loss of a, an elderly loved one before they've passed. That's not abnormal. Uh, use that energy to go spend time with him if at all possible, even if he has Alzheimer's or he doesn't know who you are. I think that you will be glad that you did later. Yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'll throw that out there. Yeah. 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 On Alzheimer's, you, you kind of have to start letting go mm -hmm. quite a lot. Uh, my my mum is still alive, but it's just her body. Her, she's gone. Um, so yeah, that's you know anticipating that is is a tough one. Fourteen a year after he died, I had a nervous breakdown. My marriage broke up over it. Yeah, Jennifer Jennifer's just joined us. She lost her dad when she was fourteen, mm -hmm. uh, and a year after he died, she had a nervous breakdown and and it broke her marriage up. Uh, okay, so so she so her her father passed when she was fourteen, and yeah. then later she had a nervous breakdown. Yeah, a year after he died, so when she was fifteen, she had a nervous breakdown, and her marriage broke up over it. So so I was she wasn't married at fifteen. I'm I'm a little confused there, but okay. Well, 
Well, I think what she's saying is that later on, later yeah. on, the fact that yeah. she hadn't dealt with her grief, um, you know, that's quite a traumatic thing to happen. Well, you know, it is. At, if at you 14, don't deal with you, it, you 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 don't even you haven't even formed yet. So that's that that's a life altering, life shaping event. Um, you know, grief it, will. Grief will do things to you that you cannot imagine. It will cause you to behave in ways that you do not understand. You will not understand that you're behaving a certain way if you're doing it through grief. And if you don't recognize the grief, you will behave in a way that is foreign to you but yet seems right. You will not be able to explain your actions even to yourself. Yeah. I, I literally I'm um, just very blessed not to have really experience this. And I'm glad to share my story with you guys. You're like my uh, my little online family. So, um, <laughs> thanks for listening. Thanks for letting me uh thanks for letting me share, you know. Um I kind of want to brighten it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that totally wrong Karen with Jennifer. Karen into it was a soggy mess. I'm so sorry, ago, Karen. She was 14. I got I'm that I'm sorry. Bit I'm so sorry. Um, but that's uh, life all, for all of us. Life comes to an end, right? And uh, we want to live healthy lives and we want to be uh, healthy as we can be. And we want to be there for one another and care about one another. And I think that's what makes our little group here special. And, and um, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is, and I yeah. think, I think the healthier you are, the easier you can cope with things that life throws your way, as well. I think, you know, I'm a believer of that. Anyway, I don't know what you think of that from a medical point of view, but if you're in your in your peak of health, well, not necessarily your peak of health, but if you're, you know, if you put shit in, you get shit out, don't you? So if you're feeding yourself well and you're looking after and your body's all working as best as it could for, for who you are, I think that, that well, it, it helps your mental state. So I think it's got to help, she said. Let me, all right, let me guess. Okay, so here's my good news that I didn't get to, that I may not have shared with all of you yet. So uh, over the last few months, I've received a number of inquiries uh, regarding pos the possibility of me um, being part of uh, television shows. Um, it's been really kind of an interesting, crazy thing. I've done uh, some Skype interviews and created some uh, personality reels and things like that for individuals. Um, and um, some of them had interesting ideas. Some of them didn't have interesting ideas. I didn't like some of what they were trying to do uh, from a medical standpoint of what their approach was and uh, so on and so forth. And this seems to be the thing now. There's uh, a number of shows that are popping up. And Dr. Lee, of course, she has her show, and, and there are others. And, and it seems to be that there uh, it, it's, it's a new niche uh, that a lot of these reality-based kind of TV networks are exploring. Um, and so because I have a little YouTube popularity, I've had, uh, I've had some inquiries. Um, and I've had, I had two of them in the last week. Uh, one of which um, we talked uh, and uh, really liked what they what their uh, idea was. Um, they were very open to hearing what I had to say, and what I said was, um, I think that uh, my clinic would be an awesome place to have a reality show. I think that if you would come in and bring your cameras, uh, that we would give you a very interesting, different uh, viewpoint of what medicine can be. Uh, a different viewpoint of what um, a physician-patient relationship can be, um, an interesting uh, back office kind of story because we have a wonderful dysfunctional little family and we all love each other at our clinic <laughs> and <laughs> and we have a good time. And so, um, uh, so uh, uh, no, no, ma'am. Yeah, Sue's on. Yeah. Sue, do I have the story to you? Oh boy. Oh my God. Anyway, Here it so, comes. Let, let me finish and then you can tell, okay? Uh, so um, I finally uh, found a, a, a production company that liked uh, what I had to offer from the standpoint of uh, us featuring our clinic and what we do that makes us different. Um, not better, just different. So uh, I actually signed a holding contract. Which gives them nine months to develop a television show. 
So I'm excited about that. Woo! 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 Uh, so <laughs> we're, you know, I'm not a dermatologist. I'm a family medicine doctor. So as you guys know, you watch our show. We do lots of different things. We do lots of, uh, we have a big variety. Um, and I think we have something interesting to offer. So I just want to let you know, I don't, I don't know if this will really happen. Um, I, I think it could. I'm excited about it, and uh, so I'm sharing that news with you guys who didn't already hear. So um, they're at least enough interested where they're sending um, a producer and a camera, either a camera person or a camera crew of one or two, I don't know, next week. And uh, we're going to try to have some interesting content for them so they can put together uh, what's uh, like a, it's, it's like a little mini uh, proposal that they then take to the networks, and they say this is – this is Dr. Gilmore. This is his clinic. This is what they want to do. This is our idea for a show. What do you think? Are you interested in it? And if they sell the show, then, then we go into production. Then we go, and that's when they come back in and they say, you know, you know that's when uh, I tell them the most important thing is is that I get the the doctor chopper. Doctor chopper. Doctor chopper. I, I told him I want a helicopter? doctor helicopter. You're talking about a helicopter Doc- now. Doctor. That's it, Doctor Copter, not Doctor Chopper. Doctor, I blew it. Doctor Copter. I told him, I said, I want. Uh, I just want you to know up front, I want a Doctor Copter. Are you going to learn to fly that then, Jack? No, I want a pilot. Are you kidding me? No, I. I just, you know, you always have to throw something weird out there, you know. Like the, you know, like what is it, the Rolling Stones? You can't have any brown M and M's in the limo or something. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's something weird. yeah, something like that. Something like that. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, YouTube's not going away. I'm not going to stop making YouTube uh, videos. I don't have any. Pl- Look, we don't have anything but a concept at this point. Okay, we don't have a show. I don't have a contract to make a show. All we have is an agreement that for the next nine months, I will let them work on a show uh, without working with other networks that's it that's all it says that's all i have all i have is an agreement that i won't keep talking to other studios while they're working on a show for me yeah okay that's, that's all i have that's brilliant uh, so um you know, julie says you, you should include this in your show <laughs> uh, and uh you are awesome nancy says you're awesome dr g not many doctors would share anything and you share all proud to be in this online family Oh, well, and thanks. Jennifer's saying ditto. You said it. Thanks. Um, oh, that's, 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 that's really cool. Actually, this is an honor for me to get to talk to you guys because I get to spend, I, and I've mentioned this before, I get to spend the time with you that I don't get to spend with my patients. I wish I had this kind of time. I wish I could sit for an hour at a time and share the knowledge that I've, that I've learned and, and, and share my experiences and, and teach people what they need to know. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I'm not blessed with that much time with each patient. So it comes in bits and pieces. Mm. Uh, so I keep inviting patients to come say, you know, you need to come join in our little chat and I haven't got anybody to join us yet. So, no. but, but eventually, well, eventually. That, w- that would be absolutely wonderful. That'd be wonderful. I had some similar news today, but not quite as fantastical as yours. Um, I, I was contacted by a, a national newspaper today. All right. Yeah. Was it was it the Daily News? I'm not going to say who it is, but it, it ah. was. It, it's a it's a, one of our Sunday papers, which is where okay. all the big articles are. Um, and they're the, the the Sunday newspapers are our top selling papers, so they're the kind of the main ones. So, um, one of them contacted me today um, because he was interested in the whole story of everything that happened on YouTube and, you know, how we've ended up here and that I came to Texas and stuff like that and, and, and my lovelies, my lovely lovelies. So um, I should be speaking to him a bit more tomorrow and uh, maybe I'll be all across the national newspapers. Woo-hoo! So that was very exciting. So um, anyway, that was my little bit of news, not quite like yours, but sort of similar. Same. No, it's still exciting. It is. I just it like, is exciting. It is exciting. It's just like just bluebirds keep flying through my window, and it's just like wonderful. I did a video about that. You know, I'm just ready to catch whatever comes in, and I'm just going to let 
let the chips fall where they may and and just you know enjoy all the opportunities that that you know come come through because it helps loads of people so it's fantastic I think that's great news. I think that's exciting. I think it. I, I think it's one. Your story is a, a wonderful story, and I, I hope it attracts more attention. To make sure that they put your um, your YouTube channel information, okay? Yeah. Because they can do that, and um, it, it, it 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 will. You should see a bump in um, in viewers. Yeah. Um, uh, it's that's usually what's happened to me in the past when when the British. Uh, paper it was the daily mail kept picking up my stories picking up my videos and and i just got so frustrated with them because they kept getting me mixed up with another dr gilmore um. they kept saying that i was an ear nose and throat surgeon in dallas texas and there's a dr john gilmore who's an ear nose and throat surgeon in dallas and i just kept reading about this dr gilmore in dallas and it's like that's me silly <laughs> you got it wrong <laughs> yeah that's a good tip definitely will do Make oh, sure I'm they just get getting real loads of congr- and they get your channel right. That's all I've got to say about yeah, that. Yeah, I will. I've just got heaps of congrats, congrats. Woo, Sue. Yes, that's great. Good stuff. Good stuff is all around. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Bless. <laughs> uh, uh, Abby wants to tell her story. Can she yeah. tell her story? Yes, yes, yes. I thought she'd she right. so quiet. I thought Did she'd you gone. Stop t- sending my mom pictures of your son. <laughs> because in the middle of class, the other day, in the middle of history class, I was taking notes, and on my computer, I get a notification from my mom. It's an image of your son. And she goes, isn't he cute? You should date him. And start shipping me with your son. And I haven't heard the end of it since. Just please don't send her anymore. She's like, he has a British accent. He's cute. <laughs> I can't even talk about anything with her without it coming up. So. Oh my goodness me! My goodness me! Well, well, there's only about three pictures of him on on my Facebook page, uh, but somebody's picked it up and wrote a comment. And for the last four or five days, all I've been getting is comments saying your son is really handsome. So I think she must have seen it in her feed. My mom even saw. Or my mom even showed my friends, and they're all like, he's so handsome, Abby. I know. So <laughs> he is. He's lovely, too. Now people think I have a husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would just this be... my that. mom. <laughs> so that's great. Well, you, you know we're coming over in the summer to see you, don't you? <laughs> so you're yeah, good to meet Yeah, I heard. <laughs> in history class. <laughs> in history class. Okay, thanks for telling me. Good night. <laughs> We've got the arranged Good. marriage sorted then. <laughs> they could, it couldn't be any worse than what we do on our own these days, I think, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, that's she so comes for the dowry, I'm telling you. She's a good catch. She, right? I, she is. I well, won't be disappointed. <laughs> oh, dear me, how funny that is. Bless them, yeah. If Finian knew how many comments he was getting, he would just be <laughs> going insane. Look, Mum, can you just take those pictures of me off Facebook? He'd <laughs> say. So I'm not going to tell him. Otherwise, I'll have to take them down because I'll have to, uh, you know. I did get his permission to put them up. You know, I'm only allowed to oh, put good. a picture up when he, like, passes a load of exams or gets an award. Apart from that, nothing's allowed to go up. <laughs> Um, I never, you know, I never know with Abby because sometimes, um, like for her thirteen, no, uh, I think it was her twelfth birthday. We had one of these birthday um, surprise things happen where they come and they put the plastic pelicans all over the yard, and uh, they leave it there for the day in a giant happy birthday sign, and 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 it's so funny. But she was so embarrassed by it that I actually had to go out there and remove them. Yeah. Uh, it was awful. The uh, the ginger snap twins definitely snapped. I mean, it was awful. <laughs> it was uh, a mess. 
How funny! Well, I think we've uh, I think we've had uh, an interesting couple of hours. Are you ready to call it a night? You got to be exhausted. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think uh, we've we've ended on a, a high. We've 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 talked about all kind of medically things, which has been fantastic. Learnt loads. We've had a great, you know, midsection there. That absolutely invaluable stuff that you shared with us. Um, and we finished on a bit of a giggle with some arranged marriage for our two children. There you go. <laughs> fantastic. So, thank you. That's great, Sue. You will have to put the article on your Facebook. Oh, gosh, it will go on the Facebook page. It will go on. I shall be doing a video about it. I'll be, there'll be all, everything. I'll be doing YouTube. It will be all over. Splashed everywhere. Everywhere. Definitely it will. So, um, I'm wondering if he knew if he's expected up. No, Finian doesn't know anything about that, and I'm just going to keep it like that. <laughs> so, uh, but he is very much uh, looking forward to coming to meet you guys. So, um, I think we'll have a lot. I think of it'll fun. be fun. We'll have a good time. Yeah, absolutely. We just need to put a date in the diary to make sure it happens. Oh, isn't that the truth? Yeah, we'll have to do that. Debbie, Debbie says she's started something off here, and she's going to officiate. <laughs> oh my goodness me! Snow White saying hi, Snow Sweetheart. She's saying the grandchildren will be beautiful. <laughs> oh, no, we've started something now, for sure. Um, yeah, okay, fantastic. And I must give you the dates of the UK Fruit Festival. Oh, one quick thing I need to say. Um, Alicia, um, the wonderful yes. chef we had on at the beginning of the week, she has emailed me the book titles that she recommended, because some of you have been asking. Um, she's also included a link to her ebook, which has got loads of recipes for um, salad dressings and sauces and stuff like that to help you, you know, spruce up your, your veg and, you know, make it more yummy for yourself. Um, so what I will do is I'm going to copy and paste that email and I will put it into the description of both of tonight's videos. But I'll also go back and put it in Alicia's the video where Alicia was on as well, okay, so that um, so that you can find those links. Um, you know, it make more sense for it to be in there. But as I've mentioned it now, I'll also put this in this one so you don't have to go trolling around looking for my, um, you know, other videos. So I just wanted to um, say that because I meant to say that. And also she wanted to thank everybody um she really enjoyed herself she thought what we were doing was absolutely fantastic and um you know she she'd love to come on again at some time in the future so you know and she was like really you know like woohoo that you embraced um her ideas um and that you've made some changes she was absolutely chuffed as chuffed could be with that so uh so i just wanted to pass that on as well awesome awesome <laughs> <laughs> the Dr. Right, Chopper guys. is in the dowry. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Finian and Abby are getting your Dr. Chopper. <laughs> uh, Dr. Real Copper. quick, somebody asked how they could find grief counseling that doesn't cost money. Call your local, call um, hospice groups that are in your area um, and ask them if they have any grief groups that meet, let them know your situation. I would be very surprised if they didn't offer to give you some courtesy counseling. Uh, very often they will, uh, and they can definitely get you plugged in. Also check with your church. You may be surprised. Uh, churches have, uh, grief counselors on staff and they have, uh, lots of, uh, resources. Um, a lot of people don't think about that. Yeah. Lori just mentioned that grief class through uh, her local church. Um, and, 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 yeah, Claudia is saying that hospice provides free counseling. So, uh, yes, um, check with your hospice groups or check with your church. I think those are both two wonderful places to go to find grief counselors. Um, okay. Uh, was there one more that I missed? I just, oh, okay. That was it. Yeah. Okay. You've been absolutely I'm fantastic. Hey, thanks guys. Thanks so much Thank for joining so us. Thank you so much. See you on Monday. Have fabulous weekends and i shall probably see you along the way i've got a recipe and a few bits and bobs to upload over the weekend so i shall be um keeping you informed on my channel and um and on facebook too 
All right, then. Lots of love. Thank you so much for hanging with us. You've been amazing. All right, guys. See you later. Bye. Bye.